Thank you. And that's the clicker. Thank you very much. All right, let me see if this works. Oh, it works very good. Okay. Hi, thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you to, uh, um, to SIS for you know, giving me a chance to speak on this stage. Uh, more importantly, I want to thank all of you for giving me the opportunity and giving me the audience to share with you some thoughts and ideas around ETFs. My name is Philip. I, I work with Nico Asset Management. I, as per the introduction earlier, I've been with the firm more than 10 years. Uh, my first five years was actually with DBS Asset Management, but uh, in 2011, the firm got merged into Nico AM. Uh, today, DBS Bank owns still 7% of uh, Nico AM. So instead of having 100% of DBS Asset Management, DBS Bank now owns 7% of Nico AM. Okay, so still very much in part of the family of the oh no, DBS Bank, because DBS is still our shareholder in a sense. Um, so I've been in the firm 11 years. Now I have spent 20 years in the investment world, but the greatest amount of time I've spent in my finance career is actually, as I mentioned, with this firm, yeah, uh, 10 plus 11 years, as the head of product development and management. Now, when, what does that mean, right? I mean, I'm no more a sell side analyst, I'm not a fund manager, so what does product development mean? It means that I look after unit trust. I oversee the, the each, each unit trust, a, 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 unit, a product is a unit trust. A unit trust is a product. Yeah? It's an investment product. Um, I look after the products, unit trust in Singapore. I altogether have about 40 funds in Singapore. I have about two funds in Hong Kong, uh, about seven funds in Australia, about 13 funds on, in Luxembourg, right? uh, one fund in Mauritius. So different, different countries, different, different jurisdictions, these all come under me. I only, I don't, the only part that I don't oversee directly is the Japan funds, the Nikko AM Japan domicile funds. So of all the funds internationally, outside of Japan, there are three ETFs, okay? There are three funds, there are ETFs that's listed on the Singapore Stock Exchange and I will introduce these to you later, okay? Um, my first part of my presentation will largely be about ETF, how, what, what is an ETF? So some of it can be very basic and some of you might even heard me talk about this before. So my apologies if it sounds a bit repetitive. My apologies if it sounds a bit too simplistic uh, because I'm trying to make it, I, 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 I need to make it brief, okay? But if you have questions and you need more details, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, but again, I have to be mindful that I have only about 20-30 minutes of time. I will try to finish my presentation in, ten, tw in 20 minutes so that I have about 5-10 minutes for questions on the floor. But again, if you feel you want to stop me and ask me a question, I strongly encourage you to do so. Um, I don't, this auditorium is quite big, so maybe a bit difficult, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do what we can. All right. Uh, firstly, introduction to Nico AM. I mentioned that uh, this is the firm I work for, Nico Asset Management. Um, we key, key thing to note here is the AUM size. We manage about $182 billion of assets. We are headquartered in Japan, uh, but we do have businesses in Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia, London. Remember, the Singapore and Hong Kong business is largely what used to be DBS asset management. Okay? Next slide, this one. Now, this slide, key message here is the 42 billion of AUM in ETFs. Yeah? Earlier, I said that the firm manages 182 billion US. Of this 182 billion, 40 billion is in ETFs. Now, Nico AM as a firm is not new to this concept or this world or product called ETF. In fact, we are one of the very first to do ETFs in Japan back in 2001. Okay? We have been winning numerous awards in Japan as well as in Singapore. Okay, we were awarded the most preferred ETF provider by uh, Investfair. This is a, a share investor last year. All right. Uh, what else can I say? Okay. Oh, ETFs. ETFs, the first thing you need to know about ETFs is that it has been growing very fast. All right. ETFs globally are growing at about 20% per annum in terms of AUM. In terms of AUM means assets under management. So the, the ETFs have been seeing a lot of subscribers, a lot of investors into ETFs. It's been growing by about 20% per annum on a global basis. Look at what it was just, uh, how many, 20, 10 years ago. It's only about 79 billion. Today, the assets under management today, under ETFs, is about $4 trillion. $4 trillion, that's like, man, I, I, that's like, 
you know, the even Singapore's country reserves is not <laughs> Singapore's country reserves a few hundred billion, right? Uh, right, four trillion dollars. I don't even know what four trillion means in my mind. Okay, now of this four trillion US dollars, seventy percent are largely institutional investors. So one of the things I need to share with you is that ETFs are invested also by the smart money, the professional money, the sovereign wealth funds, the pension funds, the fund managers themselves are buying the ETFs. In fact, they are the biggest contributors to this growth on e in ETF assets. Okay, Institutional investors are the biggest investors in ETFs. Now, not only is it growing so fast at 20% per annum, by the way, do you know 20-25% per annum growth? What it means in simple terms is this. It means that the ETF, AUM, is doubling every three, four years. That's what 25% means. Okay? So if you look at it carefully, yeah? double, 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 double. Okay? That's 20% that's growth. All right? Another key thing to highlight is that when ETS was first launched about 20, 30 years ago in the US, it was largely in equity ETS, right? The S&P 500, for example. That's how it all started. But today, there are many types of asset classes in ETFs, including bond ETFs, yeah? So fixed income ETFs. They also have alternative and commodity ETF coming into the scene, all right? So ETFs is not only growing, it's also evolving to include wider types and more different types of asset classes. What is not stated here also is that not only do we have like the standard market type ETFs, but also sector ETFs. Next, there'll be thematic ETFs. Let's say, for example, you want only healthcare or robotic stocks. There are starting to emerge this kind of thematic type ETFs for investors. Okay? Uh, a slide to show that ETFs are the talk of the town today. I've been educating, talking to, you know, on ETFs two, three years ago. I've always taken up this challenge to always you know, talk about ETFs, I have found that last six months my job is very easy <laughs> because there's so many reports out there, news reports about ETFs. Every other day you see something like, ooh, 40 billion in ETFs in one month. 40 billion. I don't, this is such a number so big, I, I don't, I can't, again, I can't quite comprehend. ETF, this is an Australian news, yeah? ETF seeing strong growth in Australia, right? Uh, in Asia, passive footprint, right? Passive ETFs are finding footprint in Asia. So every other day, I'm seeing news on ETFs, its growth and all that. So my job has been a lot easier than the last six months. And i like to encourage you to also consider ETFs because if the smart money is investing, institutional money is investing, everybody is talking about it, think people are thinking about it, why don't you think about it, Okay. Uh, my, I will, I will, my presentation is have a few sessions, all right? First, I'll cover what are ETFs, why ETFs are increasingly popular, and how I can use ETF in my portfolio. I will try to finish this in five minutes. You will see me skipping slides quite quickly, okay? Because I have only that little amount of time, so I, I, I need to move a little bit fast. And then finally, I'll end off with introducing my, the Nikko AMS 3 ETFs that is already on the Singapore Stock Exchange and easily available for you to trade. Remember, we have many ETFs in Japan, but this is not in my introduction today because it's a little bit harder for you to access the Japanese ETFs. You still can, but it's a bit harder. The most convenient are those on the SGX. All right, next slide. Now, ETF, first of all, stands for Exchange Traded Fund. Yeah, it means it's a fund that is traded on the stock exchange. The first thing you need to know about ETF is that it, is, uh, it trades like a normal stock. You can go through a broker and buy and sell the, the ETF. It trades like a stock. You can also go to online broking and buy it and trade it, okay? It trades like, a, like any other stock. Second thing is the ETFs are what we call managed to track and index. Track and index means we copy, eh? we follow as close as possible. The manager is not supposed to try to beat the index. I was sharing that in an earlier session that if the manager starts to beat the index, it means do outperform the index, I, as a product manager, I will have a problem with him. I say, excuse me, Mr. Fund Manager, you're not supposed to be beating the index. I, you think you're doing a good thing, but actually you are not. Because for the fund manager to beat the index, he has to take risks. Okay? He has to buy maybe some small cap stocks to beat the index. So that's not the intent. He needs to track the index, not beat it. His KPI is to follow the closer, the better. All right? uh, ETFs have significantly lower fees and expenses. I have a chart showing you this. Uh, and uh, that's the thing. ETFs are fully transparent. ETFs will fully disclose its holdings. If you buy a mutual fund, if you buy a, a unit trust, seldom do mutual funds disclose its full holdings. They will give you top 10, but never its full holdings. Okay? But ETFs, it, very transparent. We show you the full holdings. Yeah. All right. 
Uh, there are four methods of tracking. I won't go through the details, all right? Because, again, interest of time. But there are four major methods of for the fund manager to track an index. The most easiest one is called full replication, meaning what you see is what you get. Lah. Okay? So the STI, for example, right, has 30 stocks. So we buy the same 30 stocks in the same proportion, full replication. All right? Sampling means we don't buy all the 30 stocks, we buy samples. So instead of buying all the three banks from DBS, OCBC, and UOB, all in the index, maybe we buy one to, replicate, to sample for the, all the three. Yeah? Optimization is different. Yeah? Optimization means uh, we try to... It's a different method. It's a bit difficult for me to explain, but simply uh, an example would be, for example, some bonds are not always easily accessible. So let's say it's a bond ETF, HDB bond, for example. So sometimes the bond, my fund manager cannot get because no one is selling. So what will he do? He will, maybe he will find another bond that looks very close or operates very closely to that. Maybe an LTA bond. Somehow the, the risk profile quite similar. Okay, so that's a, an example of optimization. It's a lot more complicated than that, but I just make it simple for us to have some idea of what it is. Okay, optimization of all the three, uh, these three here are what we call invest in physical securities. That means they actually buy the underlying stock or bond. Of the three, this is the simplest, complicated, most complicated. All right, this one easy, right? What you see is what you get. Now, the last one here is called synthetic replication, meaning they use derivatives, right? For example, you can either buy some uh, futures, right? financial futures or derivatives or call options to replicate the index. This one is very complicated and uh, we have none of these. Yeah? We don't do any, none of our ETFs uses any kind of synthetics. All right, in fact, all our ETFs are, we actually buy the physical. We own the underlying shares or bonds. Okay, a we being Nico M. All right, now this is a very interesting piece about ETF. It's called the dual liquidity nature of ETF. All right, an ETF is traded like a stock. It trades on a stock exchange. Yeah, you buy and sell. But there's also this group of people that, that, that want to buy direct into the ETF, usually institutional investors. Okay, institutional investors normally buy through this route. Why? Simple, because they don't trade in the 5 cent, 10 cent, right? They buy in bulk. Okay, so they might buy one time 100 million, 200 million, right? Can you imagine 100 million buying a stock exchange, trade on exchange, it will rock the prices, okay? So this is the excess for them. Now what happens here is that the institutional investor can buy, subscribe directly to the fund, then we issue the units to them. So they don't go through the exchange. If they go through the exchange with 100 million, 200 million, they will shake the price, right? And cause a lot of disruption to poor retail investors like you and I, okay? So that's called the dual liquidity nature of an ETF. But for intents and purposes, you and I, retail investors, we normally go through the stockbroking side, okay? Uh, here's a comparison chart of stocks, uh, ETF versus stocks and unit trust. Now this is a very useful transpar uh, a chart. If you want, you can take a picture because it summarizes many things for you, right? Diversification, ETF, yes. Stocks, no, right? Stock is one stock, no diversification. Unit trust, God. Sales charge for ETF, uh, brokerage fee, 20 basis point only. Stocks, also 20 basis point. Unit trust, uh, sometimes as high as 3%. Management fee, less than 1%. Stocks got no management fee, but you do have to pay the CEO. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, unit trust, 1% to 2% management fee. All right. Intraday pricing and trading, yes. ETF trade like a stock. Stock, of course, trade like a stock. <laughs> All right. Unit trusts have no intraday pricing. Huh? It is end of day pricing. All right. So this is a very quick summary chart. All right. Next slide. Why are ETFs increasingly popular? I believe there are three key reasons that ETFs are popular. All right. The first reason is the longevity of the index. The second reason is a cost effective way to invest. And the third reason is it is actually a very simple way to invest. I'll expound on this. Number one, before I go into longevity index with uh, this tortoise here, uh, the Dow Jones Index, right? I mean, many of you have heard of the Dow Jones Index. The Dow Jones Index is one of, is one of the oldest indices in the world, all right? It, it, in fact, it is the oldest indis, index in the world. Of the Dow Jones Index today, only one company actually remains on index. I'm not going to ask you the question because we don't have time, okay? The one company is called General Electric. How many of you know what the Dow Jones Index looked like 100 years ago? Right? By the way, how many of you don't know what's the Dow Jones Index? Right, okay, I guess 
most of you have heard of it, yeah? It is, it is something like our SDI, yeah? It's 30 stocks, uh, one of the, yeah? Uh, but but it, it, it is an indication of the US uh, yeah, stock market. Right? So this was what the Dow Jones looked like back in the 1896 when it was first created. It's called Dow Jones because this, this fella, Charles Dow, created it. Uh, okay? uh, Dow and Jones, uh, so it become Dow Jones Index. This was what it, it, this was the stocks inside that portfolio, or that index back then. You notice one thing about this, this, uh, uh, these stocks, uh, these companies? Do they never heard of them really? Uh? Second thing you notice uh, is what? Doesn't it remind you of companies of Industries during the Gone with the Wind novel, huh? during the cowboy days, yeah, huh? what wow, leather companies, yeah, cotton oil, you know, you can imagine black workers picking cotton, American sugar, tobacco, yeah, real, yeah. Only one company, General Electric, still there. Huh? So now, one thing about index is this: huh? an index is a sample, a replication of the stock market, which itself is a, a sample or replication of the economy of that time. So when Dow and Jones created this index, they were trying to replicate what was very much the contributor to the American economy. You can imagine in the 1800s, these are the companies that represent the US economy. Today, cannot. Uh. So what does the Dow Jones look like today? Okay, uh, you see, this is May 2017. 3M, Coca-Cola, IBM, Exxon, Boeing, Home Depot, right? Microsoft also made it there already, right? So these are the companies that give a sample. You know, Walt Disney, I like it, yeah. A sample of what the US economy is, okay? This is what indexes do. So same thing, the SDI is an index that gives a sample of the Singapore economy, okay? Banks, Singpos, stuff like that, right? Now, so this is today's economy. This is today's Dow Jones, a sample of your US economy. This is the... Just 25 years ago, what the Dow Jones looked like. So you might say, well, 100 years ago and now that's a long time. La. But just 25 years ago, within one, our lifetime, uh, already, you see, the, the red color one are those that are already no more, no more on the index already. Okay? So the index refreshes itself to always represent as close as possible to the economy of that time. Okay? Now, that is why I say that indices have super longevity. Because as long as there is a US stock market, there will be a Dow Jones index. As long as there's a US market, there will be a S&P 500. All right? Now, so these companies are all gone because they've been refreshed. Now, I like to focus on one, Eastman Kodak. How many of you have not heard of, a, of Kodak? I think you're all a, of the age group. La. My assistant, Joey, maybe never heard of Kodak. <laughs> okay, but I think all of us have heard of Kodak, right? If you have never heard of Kodak, you must have heard of this thing called a Kodak moment. Right? Kodak moment. Now I share with you a different Kodak moment. This is the story of Kodak. Eastman Kodak. MNC's best known, a big MNC best known for photographic film. 90% of market share. Just not that far away, huh? 1976. Financial struggles in 1990. By January 2012, Kodak filed for bankruptcy. Bottom line is, business empires rise and fall, but the index will remain. Think about this. 100 years ago, all those companies are no more there except General Electric. Dow Jones is still standing. I would like to say this. The STI, for example, will outlive even maybe even DBS Bank. Okay? Because as long as there's a stock market, there will be the S a Singapore stock market, there will be the Straits Times Index. The STI Index will probably outlive. In fact, most likely, quite certainly outlive you and I. All right? We are all gone in 100 years. The STI will probably still be around. All right? So index have fantastic longevity. When you buy and invest in an index which tracks an ETF, you are really investing for the long term because you are investing in the economy of the Singapore economy in an SDI, for example. All right, the second thing I want to say is, uh, second reason, it's a very cost-effective way to invest. I already highlighted a few of that. The brokerage cost is lower than unit trust uh, sales charge. Management fee is also lower. It's a very cost-effective way to invest because, not just that, very low capital outlay because the, the lot size on SGX is 100 uh. Okay, so the share price of our ETS is either a dollar or three dollars or some around that, that you know. So for as low as a few hundred dollars, you can start investing. Although I don't encourage, I don't advise you to invest at such low quantums because your brokerage cost can be very high. 
Okay, but bottom line is that your capital outlay is quite low, as low as a few hundred dollars. But to be efficient, you should do at least you should invest at least four or five thousand dollars per pop, right? Because then you, you get efficiency from your brokerage expenses. Okay? I've already covered this too with data, so I won't go through again. Now, final thing is I want to say that uh, buying an ETF is a very simple way to invest, right? Because let's say you're buying the STI index. You're buying index, you're buying the whole index, you're buying the whole portfolio. In, in one single trade, you get the entire STI index stocks, which rebalance, and, and, and sorry, the fund manager will rebalance for you, okay? And not just that, every time the index refreshes, okay, like say now today, drop out, noble, no good, noble, out. Put in some other name, no, no, but the fund manager will also sell noble and buy something else, uh, whatever the STI put back in, okay? All right? So it is, in a way, a little bit simpler than stock picking because stock picking, you do have to do your homework, redo your research, study the... the yeah. Whereas in, a, in an index, you know, an index doesn't mean you don't need to think about it, just blindly just buy, right? No. Uh, you still need to think about it because when you buy an index, you are buying the country's economy. So some people ask me, so should I just buy STI? Well, do you believe in Singapore's economic future? La? Okay, if you don't believe in it, then don't buy SDI index. Okay, or should you buy a China ETF? Well, if you like the China economy, you can buy the China ETF. But if you don't like what China is going, uh, then don't buy the ETF. Okay, so ETFs gives you a much broader diversified portfolio, but you still do need to put some thought into it. Just that you don't have to do stock by stock deep research. Okay, uh, you also don't have to think too hard about the manager's ability to outperform. Yeah? So uh, 20 years ago, everybody thought about, oh, you know, you, uh, retail investors maybe not very good at picking stocks, so maybe put money, buy a fund, give the money to DBS AM to manage. Then after 20 years, you all look at the portfolio and say, hey, this DBS AM, uh, this guy, uh, the portfolio is also not that great. Eh? <laughs> okay? Uh, underperform the benchmark or whatever. Yeah? Oh, okay. But at least you do have to analyse the manager's ability. Okay, you are buying the index. You are buying a you know the manager's role. Remember, is to track the index, not beat the index. Because sometimes when he try to beat the index, he, you know, he, make, he, he doesn't do that well because he think he's taking certain risk. All right. So three reasons why ETFs have done well. I'd like to share a story with you. How many of you heard of this story? Yeah? the Warren Buffett one million dollar bet. Oh, got people. Huh? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so this is quite common. Huh? You Google, you can find. Huh? You just put, you just put uh, Warren Buffett $1 million back. Got a lot of news. Huh? But I'll just share a little bit of the story here because it's so interesting. In 2008, Warren Buffett made a proclamation. He said uh, that he just buy an index uh, ETF. Uh, he will beat any fund manager. Uh, whoever there to challenge him. He found a challenger, a protege partners, hedge fund manager, challenge him. He said, no, I'll take on your bet, Warren Buffett. Uh, okay, so Warren Buffett bet on the index fund that invests in S&P 500. Protégé bet that it could pick five funds, or funds that would do better over 10 years than, the, than, than, than Warren Buffett's uh, pick. Okay? Uh, eight years have passed. Huh? This was 2008. Huh? Today is 2017. Actually closer to nine years. Huh? <laughs> okay, anyway. This is a bit dated. Huh? So according to the Fortune 500 back in 2008, Buffett was already gloating today. Huh? All right? He was very happy. You know? he, he said, you know, the S&P 500 is just killing it, man. So you want to see the results? Okay. Yeah. This is the index fund. Okay, this is only to 2016, okay? I, I, I think we need to update this. Uh. All right. This is up to 2016. Eight years ago. Eight years, huh? It's 65%. Protege is 21%. So now you know why Warren Buffett is so happy. He's going to get a million bucks, I think. <laughs> okay? Yeah, he might. Yeah, he would. He would. Yeah. Good point. All right. How can I use ETF in my portfolio? Okay, one way is that, remember, remember I said ETFs are very good because you buy one ETF, you get an entire portfolio. You get a diversified market base. All right? So when you diversify, you want to diversify across different asset classes, right? You don't just want to buy only one country, right? You buy different country stocks. You want to buy different asset classes like bonds and whatever. So this is one, for example, if you, want for, if you feel that you want to allocate 40% into global bonds, are you going to go and buy your bonds yourself? No way, lah, right? It's easier to buy one global bond ETF, okay? Oh, by the way, uh, this, these numbers here, 45, 25%, 20% asset allocation, it's just an example, huh? Don't go back and, you, oh, yeah, you know what, Nico, uh, say, uh, well, this, this allocation is good for me. Uh, this, this is just an example, okay, of an asset allocation and how you can use this kind of, uh, if you want 40% in bonds, use ETFs. 
to do your asset allocation. Because ETFs are very convenient for you to do broad-based allocation around the world. Okay? Now, another thing that ETFs are useful for is what I call the cost satellite strategy. Because some people say that, hey, if I buy an ETF, then I cannot buy the stock. Huh? So should I just buy, you know, if, if I buy STI, does it mean that I cannot buy Singapore stocks now? No, not really, right? Because you can have a cost satellite approach, right? Meaning, let's say you have a core portfolio, which is the ETF. Maybe 50 or 70% is diversified in an ETF, low cost. But maybe you like one particular stock, lah. Noble, maybe. You want to take a bet, lah. put some money. Lah. So 70% in STI, 10% in Noble. Maybe you can see super normal profit. Lah. But maybe, but definitely you don't want to put all your eggs in one stock. Lah. Very dangerous. Lah, yeah? So that's called a cost satellite approach. Yeah? Your core portfolio, your major bulk of portfolio, 70% is diversified. Then if you still want to take some active bets, high risk, but potentially higher return one that you have high conviction, you really, really believe that this stock or this bond or this structured note is going to do very well for you, maybe allocate some to specific uh, selection. Okay? So that's called core and satellite. Okay? Another strategy is that you can use ETFs in is this thing called the dollar cost averaging. Right? Dollar cost averaging simply dollar cost averaging simply means that you regularly subscribe a fixed dollar amount to subscribe and buy the index. Okay? It's it's a bit like a RSP, we call it regular subscription program. Okay, regular subscription program. So for example, if every month you set aside one hundred dollars to buy the STI. So every month, $100, you buy STI. $100, buy STI. $100, STI. $100, STI. $100, STI. $100, STI. $100, okay. Now, what you're doing is, every month you're buying STI, you are accumulating your portfolio. And that causes you to average out. Because now you see, you're buying at different share prices, at different levels of the index, right? So you are getting an, a more average purchase price. Yeah, that's because sometimes we are afraid, right? If we buy at one point, uh, hey, some of you ask me, Hey, uh, uh, STI now can buy now. This is a good time. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a fund manager. So if you're afraid that you're buying on a high, but you still want to get some exposure to the Singapore market, then you can consider uh, dollar cost averaging. Spread your investment over a period of time. Okay? So that even if the STI is very high today, you didn't, you didn't put everything today. I didn't buy everything today, right? You, are, you buy today, you also buy later when you correct down, you buy back again. Yeah? So you buy more. When the market is up, you happen to buy less units because the same $100 will buy less units if the market is up. The same $100 buy less when the market is down. So you average out over time. Now, I'll later have a computation showing you if you had done dollar cost averaging for about five years, what will your return look like? Okay? Later. Now, uh, I will now introduce to you the three Nico M STI ETFs. Again, I'm going to flip quite fast. Many, many charts here, but because in the interest of time, I will skip many, many charts because it's too detailed. All right, first one is the Asia REIT ETF. Asia X Japan. You know? Some people say, is this Japan ETF? No, this is Asia X Japan. That means Asia don't include, excluding Japan. Yeah. So this ETF we launched in March listed this is the share price. Quite nice. Oh, by the way, I love this. Uh, this is, I told Joey, my assistant, to just take a, a snapshot. This is actually from the Bloomberg uh, app. Lah. I use the Bloomberg app a lot because it's on the iPhone. Every day I can see you know, wow, how, how, it's, how it's doing. You know. All right. So you have, for example, it shows you what the, the trading price, right? Uh, uh, and then the current price. Yeah. Uh, it's a bit delayed though, like 15 seconds or something, but still good enough for me. Okay. So the share price today is $1.08 .8 cents. We IPO three months ago at $1. So investors who bought an IPO are already up 8.8 .8 cents. Not only that, they would have gotten one round of dividend of 1.248 cents. Okay? So generally, people are quite happy with this. Okay? Uh, this is an ETF that tracks uh, Asia REITs. It's a portfolio of Asia REITs. All right? How many of you know what are REITs? Right? In fact, there are some later there's Suntech REITs coming out. So if Suntech REIT is actually in this index, in this portfolio also, all right? Uh, these are key things to note. The Bloomberg ticker, if you want to use the Bloomberg um, mobile phone, uh, if the ticker is AXJ REIT SP, all right? Asia X Japan REIT dot SP. The stock code on the stock exchange of Singapore is called CFA. Okay, CFA doesn't mean that we are, this product is CFA certified. Okay, it just happens that when SGX 
come out with a random three-digit number, I tio be pio, I got CFAs, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, but we, I was recently, yes, two days ago, I was given information that we have won an award for this product. All right. We were given the award of the most innovative ETF in Singapore. Award by the Asset Magazine. All right. So quite happy. My firm is quite happy. So that one, we really got an award. This CFA is randomly generated. But important for you to remember because when you go to the website or you call a stockbroker, this is the code that they use. Okay. Uh, I will skip this because it's oh, I'll skip all this. Uh, a lot of data, a lot of data, a lot of data, a lot of data. All right, I'm gonna okay. This one maybe I can talk a bit. Yeah, we have two designated market makers, Commerce Bank in Hong Kong and Flow Traders. Now I'm not gonna talk about participating dealers because it 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 doesn't concern retail investors. This is more better for uh, institutional investors who want to subscribe directly. Okay, but this is important because these designated market makers have a very important role to play. Joey. Can you remind me to remind you that you have to make this font bigger here? Okay, it's too small. All right, the role of the designated market maker is to provide two way bid offer quote of at least $50,000 on both sides. Okay, so $50,000, $50,000, 85% of the trading day. So you are assured that there will be someone to take over your stock if you want to sell. Okay, there are two market makers who market make. Daily, 85% of the time. So don't just look at the trading volume. Remember that they are market makers. Okay. Now I want to show you, oh, important thing, a regular savings program. If you want to subscribe to this one today, Maybank Kimbang for as low as $100 per month. Important slide I want to show you uh, is this one. Okay. These are the constituents of this index today. I said Suntec Rig is inside. Ma. Okay. Now this is the Weights of these 24 different different stocks, different different REITs, right? This is the dividend of each stock by stock, REIT by REIT. The weighted average is about 5.43. 5 this is the dividend that the ETF is expected to collect. All right? And we pay dividends quarterly. So the dividends we collect, net of fees, we will pay it out to the investors. All right? We have already paid one round in July, 1.248 cents. The next one is coming is in October. Okay, so if you want an income product, this is a pretty good income product, my view. Um, and the breakdown is here, yeah? The geographic breakdown is you have about 57% is Singapore property, 28% is, uh, you know, there's a blend of different properties. So when you buy this ETF, you're not worried about, oh, Singapore, maybe rental all coming down, okay? Yeah, you are still worried because 57 is Singapore, but you have, you're diversified, got some got China, Indonesia, and all that. Um, different sector, yeah? Office, retail, residential. Residential, very little, okay? But there's, there's fair mix of different sectors of REITs, different types of REITs blended into the portfolio. So you get a diversified REIT portfolio across Asia through one trade. Okay, I'm going to skip all this. I'm going to go to the STI ETF. How many of you have not heard of STI? Okay, I think all of you have. Because it's the Straits Times Index. Now, the Straits Times Index, this is what it is. The share price today is $3.40. This is how the price has been trading of the ETF, yeah? The ETF price. Okay. This is again on your iPhone, it's just a snapshot. Uh, the management fee we earn for this is very low, only 20 basis points. The fund size today is 185 million already. We are still growing it very nicely. Bloomberg ticker is uh, the ticker code, take note, uh, this DBS, uh, sti.sp. Uh. Why DBS? Because when we launched this product, we were DBS AM. We, we couldn't change this because this is a Bloomberg ticker, so I can't change We changed the name of the fund to Nico AM, but then I can't change the Bloomberg ticker code. Okay, the stock code on the SJX is G3B. Also very good. G3B stands for Good 30 Blue Chips. Okay. Uh, okay, this is a tracking error, very tight, 21 basis points. That's all you need to know. And then uh, this is the history of the trading. Yeah? You see, this is the index, this is the share price. Sorry, index and performance of the ETF. Very, very close. Uh. All right, that's, how, that's, that's what I mean by tracking very closely. Of course, sometimes there's some diversion, some a bit different. Uh, sometimes uh, some year outperform, some year underperform, a bit here and there, right? But then generally, we track as close as possible. Yes, sir. Full replication. All my ETFs today are full replication. All the three are full replication, okay? I won't go through the detail, except that one thing to note is this is the... I, I, won't, I won't go through the details of this, yeah? I don't have time today. 
Okay, I just want to cover one last thing here is this one. Regular savings program is available for P through POSB, OCBC and Maybank. Yeah? All these three provide a regular savings have reg uh, dollar cost averaging RSP program. So if you want to do a regular savings program, you can look at you can go to any of these three. Uh, it is included in CPFIS. You can also use SRS monies to buy. All right. This is I mentioned earlier about dollar cost averaging. What it would look like, yeah. So this is what we calculated. Assuming you've done one hundred dollar dollar cost every month, subscribe one hundred dollars, right? Over uh, five years. Actually, it's five years and seven months. Huh? five years and six months. 67 months. Next time, do five years are easier. 67 months, very hard to... So, six, over 67 months, you would have paid every, every month $100. Actually, 66 months, I think. $6,600. The value of the portfolio today would be 7000 You would have collected dividends of a 500 You would have made about profit of $1,000 over $100 investment over uh, 66 months. I think it's 66 huh? Oh, right. Okay, sorry. So it's 66. Over 67 months. He's correct. Because you know why? When you subscribe $100, you don't always get $100. Huh? First of all, there's commission. The broker commission. There's also, uh, you might not get round numbers of units, you see. So sometimes it's got Zao Lui, came back, give you some money back. So you don't, it's a slightly lesser than $100 a month. Okay? So, okay. All right. Now, important thing, uh, I cannot put a number here because my compliance officers say retail investors may not understand. The number to calculate the return uh, is not total return. Uh, it's this thing called IRR, internal rate of return. The internal rate of return of all this would be 5.63%. Okay? Which is the right in, uh, right way to calculate returns. Okay, now this is uh, the way we calculate it. I don't, I'm going to retail. All right, about the index. This is the index. The dividend on the index itself of all these stocks, this, 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 all these stocks, this is the top 10, is 3.2%. Okay, we are collecting 3.2% and we pay out 3.3, about 3% uh, out of the ETF. All right. Ah, oh, this is the other thing to note, huh? Very important. Huh? When we look at the STI index, which you are very familiar with, you must understand one thing. The STI index that you read about every day is the price index, not the total return index. The total return index includes dividends. So if you had held the ETF, you had made about 45%, not the 14%, which is the STI index return. Okay? Skip, 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 skip. The last product, and I have to go, is this one. It's a Singapore bond ABF Singapore Bond Index. This is an index of the ETF of Singapore government bonds, largely Singapore government bonds. Only one key slide I will show you is the breakdown. Okay, the index breakdown, the yield of the index, the bond yield is 2.15%. This is the breakdown, yeah? So it's mainly Singapore government. I don't know whether you consider how HDB, Temasek, and LTA, SP Power government or not, uh. Okay, but this is what this all down there. All right, the pure Singapore government is 86%. HDB, Tamase, little, uh, okay, there. A little bit in some other foreign bank who, for the foreign bank, foreign government uh, own banks which issue Sing dollar bonds. Very, very, very small. Very seldom. Like, where would Korea Bank go? Don't know why they go and issue Sing dollar, but usually very, very small amount. Okay, so last slide, very important for you is this. This fund returns roughly about 3% per annum. It is, this index does even better than the G7 government bond index, usually called the Citibank uh, World Government Bond Index. G7 comprises this country. So the Singapore government bonds is doing better than G7 country government bonds in Sing dollar terms. Okay? So with that, I have to end before they kick me out of the stage. Triple A rating, uh, Singapore government. Okay. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you.